This is uh, eight simple rules for running your JavaScript on my page. Um, and I want to warn you, it's not actually eight simple rules. There's an infinite number of rules, and I'm going to uh, get into quite a few of them. Um, I've been uh, contact information's there. It'll probably appear at the end if I'm not mistaken. Um, I had a sudden gust of gravity take my regular laptop this morning, so I had to kind of redo all of this from memory, and it's it's pretty scattered. A um, couple things I like to do before I do these things: disclaimerama um, about my employer, about me, about what I'm going to say to you guys. Um, I work at Pinterest. Um, What's it like? Yes, it's awesome. Okay, uh, Best answer ever from Tracy Chow, who used to work at Cora, who now we stole for the Pinterest back end. It's a happy, inspiring, creative, friendly place to work. On a happy, inspiring, creative, friendly product, I wake up every day excited to go to work. Okay, And I'm 50 years old, and I have waited my entire life for a situation like this. I wake up every day, and I'm excited to go to work. So yeah, it's completely awesome. Um, we're hiring. Yes, please join us if you can. Uh, Pinterest.com about careers, front end, back end. Um, if you're awesome and you walk in and they notice that you're awesome, they will hire you and just make a job for you. Um, most people want to know where's the API for Pinterest. Uh, the, official, the official official word on the Pinterest API is we are thinking about it very, very carefully because we don't want to screw it up. Um, personally, from the bottom of my heart, I invite everyone who's ever built something on an unsupported API to stop doing that, OK? Please, please don't do that. Don't ship it. Um, make mashups, OK? Go nuts with that. Learn as much as you can. Figure out the API that's lurking back there. I mean, people are, are sniffing the packets from the iPhone app and doing all sorts of stuff. But don't ship anything, OK? Because it will break. And when it does break, Pinterest will look like a jerk, or Yahoo will look like a jerk, or Netflix will look like a jerk, or whoever it is will look like a jerk. Um, and it really shouldn't be our fault. So please don't do that. Um, about me, as you might be able to tell, I have no actual engineering qualifications of any sort. Um, I've just been doing this for a really, really long time. And I, am, I like to think of myself as living proof that just about anybody can do this stuff and get away with it. Um, I've been everywhere. Um, I started out at Atari in 1977 when I was 16 years old, um, uh, pushing um, 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 big, big cabinet video games out the back door. And uh, my dad was a technical writer there. And I helped him edit the first Atari 400-800 basic programming manual. And I was the guy who typed in all the listings to make sure everything worked. And um, I, I knew at that point that I didn't want to push arcade games out the back of a garage anymore. I, I wanted to do this for a living. Um, WebMD, the company that became WebMD, I joined in 84, worked there for almost 19 years, which was insane. Uh, Yahoo 2004, 2009, um, where I learned about professional front end engineering. I, I think we actually kind of invented it at Yahoo right, right in those years. And not too many people are, are really aware of it. But they, they codified a lot of that stuff, a lot of the, the separation of concerns, um, uh, just generally a web dev was no longer a web dev. They came to us and, oh, third quarter 2004 and said, OK, all of you web devs, you are now engineers, just like that. We touched code, therefore we were engineers. And, and we, had to, we had to learn how to do it and do it right. Um, and a lot of those people have gone, gone on and, and done amazing things. Uh, Steve Souders is here. Nicholas Akis is here. Those guys were at Yahoo in those years. So love those guys. Uh, Netflix 2009, 2010. Um, Built widgets for Netflix, uh, which I am not going to be able to show you in this talk, but the talk is about doing the sort of thing that I did at Netflix, uh, and Netflix for the iPhone, which is um, a, it's a website that runs inside a web view. So Netflix for the iPhone, when it originally shipped, I'm not sure how it is right now, but when it originally shipped, it was just CSS, JavaScript, and HTML running on open APIs. So I, I learned a lot doing that. Uh, Lexity, small startup. You may not have heard of them. Um, they're in Mountain View. And I uh, instrumented and broke a whole bunch of shopping sites with my, with my little uh, third-party JavaScript uh, at Lexity. Uh, right now, I'm at Pinterest. Um, and I am in charge of the pin it button. So if you press the button and the thing slides down and obscures the site um, and you pick something and pin it, I made that. And if it's broken, it's totally my fault. And I'm happy to talk to anyone who's angry about that. No, seriously, if, if there's a problem with uh, the Pinterest button, let me know. Uh, and I'm also working on the pin it button and getting credit for um, things like Flickr images and YouTube videos and Vimeo, stuff like that. So um, a recurring theme in my life, rather than building code that runs on other pages, I always seem to wind up building code that has to run on every other goddamn page on the web. So today, I will be channeling for everyone whose site I have personally broken in the last 16 years of doing this. So there's a lot of ah that you hear over the phone when you, when you do these things. Um, 
So is this HTML5 the number one question I get? Oh, you're doing HTML5. No, I'm not doing HTML5. This is just barely Web 2.0. As soon as JavaScript got to the point where we could actually access the DOM and create a node, um, we started being able to do what I'm going to show you. And that's been, I don't know, 8 or 10 or 12 years or something like that. So none of this stuff is cutting edge. This is super non-cutting edge. All right. So, oh, yeah, and the HTML5 question comes up constantly wherever I go. And I've established there's a, there's a really quick, easy test you can do how to tell if it's HTML5. Try it with Internet Explorer. <laughs> Did it work? No? That's HTML5. <laughs> so, my favorite slide. Still true. Uh, IE10 preview is out there floating around. And uh, most of the stuff runs on IE10, but nobody's got IE10 preview edition. So. Uh, dire, dire warnings. Here we go. Anything that can possibly go wrong with third-party JavaScript will go wrong. And when it breaks, it will do so in a completely irreproducible fashion. You'll have a dude on the phone who says, my page is broken, and you won't be able to reproduce the conditions. Uh, and when it breaks, he will take that page down, and it will be your fault. Your fault, because he loaded your script. You broke his store. Uh, he didn't sell hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of wine that day, so he wants you to pay him that money. Uh, therefore, anyone who can possibly be discouraged from shipping third-party JavaScript should be discouraged from shipping third-party JavaScript. Um, unfortunately, the alternatives really suck. Um, applets, applets, you can't really do applets anymore. My understanding is the main browsers have basically said no more applets, which is kind of awesome. Yay. Uh, Flash, we're, we're moving away from Flash, thank goodness. Um, although Flash is just fine for, for embedding large things like movies and, and, and slide presentations. We haven't quite gotten our, our act together with HTML5 yet. Uh, and iframes. Um, many times there is, there's no choice, but you have to ship an iframe. But I keep it in the kind of the yuck category. Um, the limiting factor for many people running third-party JavaScript is most of the popular platforms won't let you do it. So most people aren't creating a web page anymore. Nobody's got GeoCities where you can just jump out there and do it. They're just blogging on blogging platforms. And they'll never see your third-party widget. Um, so it's useful for instrumentation if you want to collect statistics about stuff. It might be useful for doing badges like the little pin it button with the number of times it's been pinned or the dig button. Uh, browser extensions and toolbar bookmarklets are both actually pretty useful, but you have to be careful not to break things. Uh, no, what you don't want to try is complex interactions. And I've, I've built really complex third-party widgets, and, and they, they all fail. So eight rules. Don't overstep. Don't break the DOM. Don't create global variables. Don't steal the listeners. Don't fuck up the user's experience. Don't hog the event listeners. Don't overwrite my root style sheet. Oh, look, eight more rules. <laughs> no alerts. No document write. No on error. No console log. Don't break it on mobile. No hover-based interactions. Don't even think about drag and drop and be very careful about keyboard interactions. Oh, hi, even more rules. Please ship source code along with your third-party widget. So I'm, 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 I'm running a third-party widget that has been minified and crammed into as few characters as possible. But I would really like to see the source of this thing so I understand what's going on. Your source should pass JS lint. Unstrict. Doug Crockford Nazi mode. It should absolutely pass. Okay? <laughs> Do not break my instrumentation. Okay? I could be using Google Analytics. You could break it. Don't spy on my users. Don't do any infinite loops. Okay? <laughs> infinite loops bad. Uh, I think I've said this already. No hover-based interactions. Don't even think about drag and drop. Ooh, I'm repeating myself. We'll just skip. In the end, there's really only, rule, only one rule, which is don't block. Okay? Fortunately, JavaScript is really, really good at don't block. JavaScript has evolved for many, many years not to block. And we, the third-party widget vendors, insist on making it block. We have to stop doing that. So a uh, couple of requests and rants, although I've been ranting already. Sorry. Um, Use your iframes very carefully, if not at all. Um, they cannot be instrumented. My, my biggest request with the pin it button, the button that actually shows up inside the web page, is, hey, I want to instrument this thing. How do I do this? That means when somebody clicks it, they want to know before we get the click. Um, iframes create their own DOM. iframes hog the connection pool. Um, they will cause IE6 and IE7 to just go down to nothing. Um, they can block the window on load if you're looking for window on load first. Uh, they're, hard to, they're impossible to style, of course, and they spy on my readers. Uh, don't hide the source. I already said that. Uh, don't ship it compressed. Please ship me widget.source.js. That should just be a standard, okay? If you're downloading widget.js, widget.source.js should give you the non-encumbered version so you can see it. If I can't see what it's doing, I don't want to run it. Um, 
do not throw a bunch of libraries down on my page after I have taken the trusting step of downloading your widget. I don't want a whole bunch of UE or jQuery or, or, or you know, prototype or whatever it is that you're using that's awesome. If you can't give me some beautiful hand-whittled JavaScript that just does the one thing you want it to do, I don't want to run it. You're doing it wrong. Um, and especially, if you fail to warn me that you are connecting my site to Facebook in any way, shape, or form, I will hunt you down and kill you like the dog that you are. <laughs> Sorry. Not, you know, Facebook, awesome, but so many people install things from Facebook that haul down a whole bunch of Facebook scrap. Yeah. And the uh, licensing is not super clear. Okay, uh, time, ooh, I'm doing okay on time. Um, sorry, I'm rushing because I don't know how long this goes. Um, basic stuff, there are uh, dependency issues. Um, people, people think that JavaScript will do one thing and it actually does something else depending on where you put it in the DOM. Uh, there's portability issues, uh, lots of compatibility issues, and occasional bits of security trouble. You don't want to get that alert, oh, we're trying to load some unsecure crap from a secure page. You don't want that. Um, your third-party JavaScript cannot depend on page load. You cannot trust um, users to, users being me, I'm ranting about me, my want. You cannot trust me, the idiot, to, to install it correctly. No matter how well you document it and say, this has to go in the head tag, or this has to go very last, right in front of the closing body tag, they'll screw it up, okay? Um, people who are paying attention are going to want to load your tag asynchronously anyway, and I'll show you a loader real quick. Um, Wom, oh, I did some goofy global, sorry, never mind, next page. Um, <laughs> Whoa, man, that was awesome. Um, it has to work anywhere on my page. Um, oftentimes, we're using things like Shopify or uh, WordPress or, or other uh, CMSs. And occasionally, you'll run into people who are using things like Yahoo Stores. Yes, still, Yahoo Stores is out there. It's hugely profitable, and people are using the hell out of it. Um, and they don't know what head, body, and HTML mean, because what they've got is they've got a web form. And they are filling out blanks in a web form. And the, one blank may be the head, and one blank may be the body. One blank might be the foot but you're not really sure. So nobody really knows what they're doing with those things. Um, and even if they know what they're doing uh, and where they should be going with their stuff, oftentimes they just don't have access. They're filling out web forms and the, and the, and the um, provider has, has decreed only our stuff's gonna go in the head or we own the closing body tag because our tracking information has to go right, right before the closing body tag. Um, it must not break in IE. We laugh at IE, I, I curse IE constantly, but really seriously, there are a lot of people out there who are using IE. And depending on the market segment you're going after, if you're going after uh, people who are heavy into shopping, for instance, um, the mom and pop demographic, people who have hair the same color as mine, okay, you will run into a lot of IE out there. Uh, and your widget cannot break in IE, even older versions, okay, IE 5.5.6, um, you've got to test that stuff, and you have to come up with a really simple way of telling your widget, okay, if we're an old IE, just go away. Don't even render, don't do anything. Hold still and be quiet, because we're in IE right now, okay? Um, you have to test, okay, and you have to tell me which are the versions that are not supported, so when I start to get goofy reports from my users, oh crap, the site broke, it's on IE, and, and, I, and I, I need to constantly ping them back and forth, what version, Okay, what computer, uh, okay, when was this updated? I, I need to know m a lot about m what you're supporting. Um, you have to test, you have to have real live human beings testing this thing. Um, you have to own a physical computer, hopefully a big ugly desktop computer that's under a desk that you can kick whenever you sit down in front of it, uh, that runs actual Windows XP and actual Windows Vista and actual Windows 7 and God help us Windows 8, which is coming soon. Um, you can't even try doing this with virtual hardware. Virtual hardware is, is awesome, and it's a, it's a wonderful security blanket to have. I have a virtual box that's running Windows XP, and I can just fire it up anytime I want, and I can check this, and it's fine. Okay. Well, no, it isn't. You're running an idealized virtual box on a computer that's probably a 1,000 times faster than your end user is actually running. Um, and be very, very careful once you do get this browser lab set up. Don't let Microsoft update your test machines because it will constantly try to go in there and upgrade you and get you away from IE7. No, you can't have IE7 anymore. Um, never surprised me with an update, okay? And I realize I may have downloaded your widget and never talked to you at all and just installed it, but somehow you've got to communicate to me that there's an update. Um, you need to version your stuff properly. Uh, the URL should actually have forward slash one, forward slash two, whatever it is. You know, just like an API version, the widget. Um, communicate your updates, and just in case I don't install the new version, you have to support the old version forever, okay? Even if that's shipping me something that quietly sits there and does absolutely nothing just the way it does with IE6. Um, when we start to uh, load 
individual components, we want to stay scheme agnostic. Sorry, I'm drying up. Um, in front of the resources, we want to avoid uh, sp specifically saying HTTP and HTTPS. Um, just use forward slash forward slash, and you can see, see if my highlight shows on the big screen. It kind of does. All right, so right there, that's going to load in um, a page that is HTTP or HTTPS, and it's not going to throw a bunch of errors. Um, yes, this means you also do need to ship an HTTPS version. That's on you. You're, you're supplying this widget. Um, and yes, you also need scheme agnostic URLs for images that you, that you bring down inside the widget should you choose to do so. Uh, oh, I'm, geez. I'm tearing through this. This is great. Um, so uh, a quick implementation notes, and then I'm going to show you some actual code. And what we're going to wind up with at the end of this is there will be a, a block of code, I think 69 lines, something like that, which will put a pretty, pretty nice independent widget up on anybody's screen in the universe. And uh, code's on GitHub. It'll be on the last slide. Um, so keep in mind my header body might not actually exist. So when I'm getting ready to load this script, OK, um, the universal solution to loading a script, doing it asynchronously, is you make a script tag, and you go through the entire DOM of the thing, and you look for the first script tag. And even if there's only one script tag, it's the script that's currently calling this thing. So you know there's at least one script tag there. Find it and insert the script that you're making in front of that script. OK? Um, the example I'm going to show actually shows the, the script itself going into the DOM to put the widget right where we want it in page order. But when we're loading asynchronous scripts, things like instrumentation, this is how we want to do it. Um, this is real simple. This is not original with me, except for one line right there, which I'll show you in a second. Um, what we're doing is we're looking for the first script on the page. Well, actually, way down here, we were passing document. Okay, And that is a pointer to document. So inside our anonymous script, which is contained in those two paragraphs, that script now has a pointer to document. And you'll see this pattern uh, again later on. So document is now D. It's shorthand. It's a lovely single letter variable. It drives my coworkers crazy, but I stick with my single letter, single letter variables. Uh, and the first script is going to be document, get elements by tag name script, zero. It's the first one we found. And it could be the script that's actually calling us right now. Great, we found a script. Um, then we're going to create an empty script tag. We're going to set async equals true, which works in some but not all browsers. It is apparently helpful in some but not all browsers, and I won't try to get into which browsers it is. Uh, we're going to set a type. Um, if we were being really careful here, we would also be setting a character set. I would be setting character set UTF-8, uh, but I'm a boob and I made this quickly. So uh, we're going to set our source using scheme agnostic URLs right there. Source of the script, foo.com, widget.js. And then we are going to insert the script into the DOM right before that first script that we found. Okay? As soon as we do that, it's going to fire off a request to the server, and it's going to run the script just like that. This approach should not block anything during loading. Okay? Um, and this mysterious bit right here, I will show you later in a little bit. This is um, one of the ways in which you can actually pass configuration, um, configuration, administration, uh, configuration information to the script that you just created, okay, without having to have a separate script in the body of the HTML that says config equals one, two, three, four, five. And I'll show you more about that later. That's a bad thing. Okay. So in general, in our quest to not pollute the global variable namespace, we're going to hold ourselves to one global variable. Our script is going to get one and only one global, global variable. Uh, and keep in mind, any IDs that you put on an HTML tag, that's a global variable. That's very crashable. Uh, you got to be very careful about that. Um, and because we are using one and only one global variable and an HTML ID, um, how are we going to style this thing? Uh, reasonable paranoia. What we're going to do is wrap everything in the anonymous function, same pattern as before, parentheses up above and below, uh, and it fires off as soon as it runs. We're going to create a random string, and then we're going to create a global namespace root from this random string. So the program itself, the script itself, is going to have a global based on this random string of crap, which we will generate. And the HTML ID that we put on the page will also be the same thing. And it will really greatly minimize the, um, the chance that we will get, will get crashed. Warning, this is not a magic bullet, blah, blah, blah. Um, almost certainly won't unintentionally get hosed. Uh, but if you've got someone who is actually, actually has access to your DOM, you will be able to track this down and screw it up. But obviously, if you have people in your DOM, you have a much bigger problem than me. Um, so the goal, build a widget 
appears on the page whenever the user inserts a single line of JavaScript. It's going to, it's going to appear right where the JavaScript tag is. Okay? It's going to accept configuration requests from outside. It's not going to pollute the global namespace, and it's not going to break or be broken by the surrounding CSS. And I didn't put this. It's actually going to do something when we click it. All right, so configuration. Don't want me to do this, OK? That var config, that's a global variable. I've just polluted the, glo the, the, the global namespace there. Uh, don't do this because, number one, I will screw it up because I'm a civilian, right? And config is a global variable. You don't do that. Uh, what's better is we uh, create a script. OK, and I blew it. I have a non-platform agnostic thing right there. That should be gone. Sorry. Uh, script source equals foo.com, widget.js. And we're going to put in another attribute, data-config equals whatever we want to put in there. OK, right now it's just hello world. It's going to be the little message inside the widget. How we're going to access this is actually kind of complicated. We're going to set this attribute. And when we load the program, we're going to loop through all the script tags on the page. And as soon as we find one, whose source matches the script that we're looking for, okay, we're going to look and see in data config if it's there. Aha, we have our configuration variable. Then we're going to delete that script node because it's already running. right? Then we're going to quit looking. We, you don't want to skip on to the next one. And then we're going to go, to, going to, we're going to go ahead and fire off the behavior of, of whatever it is. Uh, and I'm really sorry this is too low for you guys. Um, I promise you I will get this online somehow. Sorry about that. Um, so bonus, if the same script tag finds itself again in the source of the document, it will go ahead and run again. So you can run an unlimited number of these things. Not recommended, but you can run an unlimited number of these things. Um, so this is the basic pattern here. And again, it's too low for most people in the back. Sorry about that. Um, what we're doing is creating an anonymous function. And this dollar sign variable here that everything hinges on, dollar sign variable is going to take this random string of crap that we're generating at the bottom there. We're taking an underscore, and we are appending new date get time. So it's going to be underscore 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, whatever it turns out to be. Okay? And we're going to use that as the key here. We're going to say dollar sign equals window. And we passed window in down here at the bottom along with document. right? So window, our random number, equals an object. And our random number is whatever it is, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, and inside this object, we're going to have uh, some other objects. Uh, this A variable is the A object is going to contain things that we're passing into it. Uh, D is document, W is window. We're not using it. We're not using window in this example, but there it is anyway. And then F right there is an object that's going to contain a list of functions. Okay, and anywhere inside this function, we're going to be able to say dollar sign F name of function, whatever it is, and go ahead and fire it off. Um, this is a great shortcut because you can use the randomly created uh, root object, or if you have your own root object, you can just specify what it is. It can be Netflix, Pinterest, Yahoo, whatever, whatever you want there. Uh, and then the source that we're going to look for later down here is a regular expression. It's widget.js with a dollar sign on the end. So we're looking for a, a, a script tag whose source ends in uh, widget.js. And I'm, again, really sorry about this. Uh, okay, so to find the correct script tag to fire off, uh, we're going we're gonna, to, let's go back. Right here where it says init, if this ran right now, what would happen is we would get an alert with my random ideas, whatever it is. I'm changing init on the next page, right here. And here we go. We're going to look for the script tag. So we're going to grab all of the script tags. We're going to loop through them. And if the source of any, either any of these script tags matches this value that we passed previously, Right, widget.js. We're going to go ahead and fire off our structure. It's going to—it's another function under dollar sign f. It's going to build whatever it is, and then we're going to break. Okay. And this is structure. Structure again is huge, and it goes way down there. It's a bunch of DOM node creation. Um, here we are getting the value of data config, which I passed previously in the script. We're storing it in our global variable object a, so we have this wherever we go on the page. Okay. We're going to create an empty object for the structure to sit inside. We're going to create a div, and we're going to give it the ID of BD as in body. Okay? And we're going to prepend the crazy random number that we made. So the actual ID of the thing is going to be underscore crazy random number underscore BD. This is important later for styling purposes. We're going to create a span. We're going to stick the config variable in the span, so the span is going to pop up and say hello world. We're going to append the span to the body. Then we're going to create a link. And the link is going to have the same sort of ID, only it's going to be X. And inside the inner HTML, we'll have X. 
And when somebody clicks on this, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to. This will be our sole interaction for this horribly primitive little thing. Uh, then we do some appends to fix it all up. And then right here, the value of script is the script that we found earlier. Okay. And right here, script parent node is where we're going to insert the thing that we made. So above the script that's calling all this junk, we're going to insert our widget. And then we're going to remove the script node. So it's completely gone. And it's exactly as if it had been in HTML source all along. This div is just magically there. It's, it's kind of awesome to look at. I'll show you later. Uh, and then we're going to fire off our next step, which is presentation. Notice I'm separating structure, presentation, and behavior. I'm doing structure first, presentation next, then behavior, which is how we should make web pages. All right, and then this is just a little filler here. These are my CSS rules, and they're being passed down at the very bottom of the page. Okay, and I'm just I'm just said here's an array of strings, and these are recognizably CSS right here. Right, I'm setting some padding, some positioning, and this pound sign underscore body pound sign underscore x. What we're going to do later is we're going to search for pound sign underscore anything, and we're going to drop in the the random number that we made before. And the CSS lines are broken into um, uh, multiple strings so I can get them on the screen, but this will actually work. Uh, so we're going to create the style sheet next. This is my presentation function. This is a really, really standard way of creating a style sheet with JavaScript. That is super, super old school technology, uh, very recognizable. We're going to take the rules, concatenate them all together, search and replace underscore pound sign with underscore random name pound sign, right? So I've just assigned the ID. Um, and I'm matching my CSS to the ID that I, that I assigned the thing previously. And then uh, just, to be, just to be absolutely double sure, I'm going to go through here and replace semicolon with exclamation point important semicolon. This is a legitimate, totally legitimate use of the important tag in CSS. And it makes me feel dirty every time I do it, man. <laughs> so when we're done creating our style sheet, we're going to figure out what is the head tag of this document. And this is probably something I would have done in init. I would say d.h equals document, get the, get the, get the head tag. Um, as soon as I have my head tag, I append my CSS. And then I'm off to my third and final function, which is behavior, actually wiring something up to happen when this, when this widget pops up. And this is behavior. And I lighted several functions. Uh, so down here below, the behavior function is going to call a generic function which adds listeners. And if you do more than one listener, you're going to need something like this. This is a, a great way to add listeners for uh, click, hover, mouse over, out, whatever it is. Whatever the event is, you can always add it with, with this particular chunk of code here. And that's a super generic chunk of code. That's been around for centuries. Uh, works for all browsers. What I'm showing here works in everything, uh, IE6 on down, absolutely everything. Um, so we're going to add a listener for a click on the, um, the little X thing that we're putting at the top, right? And as soon as we hear it, we are going to run our close function, which is right here. And as soon as, as, soon as somebody clicks the X, we're going to go to the parent node of that structure that we created way back here, right? Dollar sign SBD for body. That's our container that has absolutely everything in it. And as soon as we get to the behavior and we want to close it, we're going to go here to the parent node, remove child, the thing we want to remove. It's magical. It's gone now. Um, and that's the extent of it. That's, that's the whole thing right there. Um, very important note when you're adding listeners. Um, I debated, and I, I'm, I'm glad I kept it down because it would have been a really uh, tall pile of code here. But what you should be doing is you should be adding a single listener uh, for the entire thing that you are creating, OK? And not separate listeners for every link. Um, if you start doing badges, if you start doing things like uh, badge somebody's Twitter feed, which is on my blog somewhere. I've got like the badge, badge anybody's Twitter feed. There will be hundreds and hundreds of things that all have listeners on them. There'll be all of these, uh, all these links and things. And what you don't want to do is assign a whole bunch of listeners to these individual things. You want to use a bubbling technique. So you assign a single event listener to the entirety of the, uh, of the thing, uh, and you look for clicks. And if we've got a click, then we figure out which thing is being clicked. And if the thing that's being clicked actually happens to match something that needs to do something, then we go ahead and do stuff. Um, we don't assign a separate event listener to every single link on the, on the thing that we've just created. That's, that's, uh, that's bad technique. <sighs> and remember, trying to implement hover-based interactions will break your heart. And this is one of, the, um, one of the primary reasons why we go to things like jQuery, is 
if I want to have a block of stuff, if I want to have like a nice little pin on Pinterest, for, instance, for example, there's a square thing, there's image, there's link, there's title, there's a bunch of things you can interact with. And we need to know if you're hovering over anything that is over any part of this deal. And, and the hover thing is, is, is very, very hard to do without a proper library. And, and you don't want to try to abstract out the part of jQuery that actually does this and ship it down. Um, hover is also a bad idea uh, because you're going to break the mobile experience. And I think one of the, one of the, one of the earlier rules I had was uh, don't break the mobile experience. And um, hover, hover while, while neat, um, I think it is no longer safe for us to assume that the person viewing the page actually has a mouse. The only thing I'm looking at now is, uh, is really mouse up. Um, I, I waffle between mouse down and mouse up. And then there's a touch start and touch end as well. Um, and you can detect and do, do the right things there. Oops, don't go to sleep thing. That'd be bad. OK, so here it is. This is the entire thing right here. Um, and what I've got is approximately 70 lines of code that builds this exact thing. See the little red box, the hello world right here. Uh, and I'll see. Let's try this. Oh, nice. OK. So we can actually see where it is in the DOM. Can you? Can we kind of see it? Uh, so there's a list item. And I'm really trying to get this as high as I can. I'm sorry about that. Uh, wait, yes, there we go. OK, so right here, div ID equals underscore very long number, underscore BD. That's the uh, red box. And then when I pop it open, underneath there, I've got a span with hello world in it, uh, which I didn't give to an ID because I didn't need to. It's just containing some text. And then I've got this link with a separate ID. And we're listening for clicks on that link. OK, and all it's going to do when someone clicks on it is go away. Uh, and I'm not going to do that yet. So we're going to look at the source. I don't want selection source. I want page source. And this, we can find it. Yeah, this whole thing is just a web page. I didn't, I didn't do any PowerPoint or anything. Um, so right here is the actual source that made the thing. So the page going in has this script source equals widget.js. Uh, if I can, no, I don't want to try raising the font size. I'll break it, sorry. Um, Going in in source, this is what this looks like. There's a script tag in there. Once the page renders, that script tag is magically gone. And what's in there is just the div containing the thing. And let's see if it works. Drum roll, please. Oh, it works. Fabulous. And then that's all it does. Um, and this is a perfectly acceptable way of building any sort of little interactive button that has to lead, lead back to your page, do stuff with your page. Um, and real quick, I'm not going to go through too much of the code here. You can kind of see how it stacks up, though. Um, I did move a few things around. I moved uh, the document head getter down here to the, uh, to the init function. Um, a lot of people, uh, people want to know why dollar sign $f. Um, why don't I just have all of these functions down here at the root level? And that's just purely personal preference. Um, I built a lot of these things. So I can take dollar sign $f dot listen right here out of this program and drop it completely untouched into anything else I'm, I'm, I'm using uh, with this pattern. And, and I think um, supportability is, is really super useful. Uh, the, the person supporting this is, is going to have a really tough time. Um, so if you're doing these things, if you're starting to think about third-party widgets, I, I do want to recommend that you, that you have a full-time person whose job this is to do. Um, this is not, um, it's not a really fun thing for someone who is somebody who is up to his armpits in, in Python and getting the front end of the website out and doing all that all that, all that great stuff and it's uh, that's that's a completely different kind of um, kind of arena than, than building code that runs on everybody else's page. Um, it's it's tough to dip into and dip back out of. Uh, I have to keep the Pinterest the the add to Pinterest button. I kind of have to work on that every day just to keep it fresh in my head. Um, I would recommend if you're if you're doing something like this. Have somebody whose whose primary job that is to to take care of, uh, and that person is also probably going to field a lot of those phone calls and, and emails too. Um, and I think, yes, final slide. Um, thank you, former employers. Uh, thank you, my dear sweet wife, and thank you, Coda Two. If you guys have not looked at Coda Two yet, Coda Two is freaking awesome, man. I got this thing done uh, this morning. Upstairs, it was in my head and nowhere else in the universe, and I busted out Coda 2, and I got it done. I'm really, really happy with that. Um, if you would like to see the source, which I will update with the final, final bit, um, the source is from a really, really old GitHub repository of mine. I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, this is like a two-year-old repository, but I just updated it last night. So if you're, if you're at all interested in this little stub, grab it from there. 
Uh, feel, feel, totally feel free to use it. Uh, contact me if you have any questions. Um, and this is how you reach me. I am Kent Brew on all social networks that have not kicked me off yet. So are there questions? Sir? Because my eyes are very small and I can see it. I'm sorry, the, the question was, why the dollar sign variable? Um, I actually started using it before there was jQuery, and, and it's super confusing now. And I have, what, I had, what I did at Netflix is I did a big capital N, and what I did at Lexity was a big capital L, just because there were jQuery people on staff and it bothered them. Um, but it's, it's super easy. You can, you can pick whatever you want. Sir? That is true. Um, I probably made a mistake, and I can go ahead and append it to the body. Um, I should be testing for it. Chances are pretty good. If it's that badly screwed up, we probably don't want to go ahead and don't want to render the widget anyway. So, uh, but you're right. I, I should I shouldn't be I should not be putting it on head. Um, what should I be doing? I should be testing for for presence of head and body and using the one that I find. So, yeah, you're right. Thank you. The question is, why are my variables so small, and why, are there, why is there no uh, comments in my source? Um, if you look at the, the most recent but last commit to GitHub, you'll find a comment line on every single line of source. Um, and as far as the, the single letter variables, uh, they, key really well, they, they key well for me mnemonically. $A is an argument. $S is structure. Uh, and it, it just it's totally personal preference and it works for me. I mean, there's there's no reason at all why you couldn't say, you know, dollar sign dot arg dot whatever it is. I mean, I'm just saying uh, if you're trying to make the code like your unmodified version of the code readable so everybody can understand it, would you usually include comments to clarify? Yes, that? yes, absolutely. Hell yes. 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 Please comment. Yes, thank you. I uh, I need to put that in the presentation. Please comment everything. Uh, you had your hand up earlier, sorry. Why do I remove the script tag that I started with? I remove the script tag that I started with in case there are multiple copies of the same script tag running on the same page. If it's gone, then the next time the thing fires off, it'll find the next one and the next one and the next one. And it's interesting because it isn't necessarily the, the instance of the script finding itself. It's just finding the first one in source order. But I've, I've never actually had it fail. It, it seems to work really well. Are the agnostic URLs supported across all browsers? I believe they are, yes. Yeah, I've not had trouble with that. I've, I've looked at IE6, I've gone, gone all the way down. So. Sir? Uh, do you have the widget interact back with its uh, I guess home website? And how do you get around cross-site? Do I have the widget interact with its home site? How do I get around cross-site scripting? Uh, yes, actually I do. I have um, the first one of these I did. It's one of those complex interactions that I said don't do. But the first time I, I really did a big one of these uh, was for a Yahoo Hack Day. And what I did is I rolled up a single line of JavaScript that would include uh, Yahoo Search, which rocked back then. Uh, it no longer does. Um, which included uh, Yahoo Search. Um, and you could type in whatever you wanted in the, in the search box, and it would immediately jump out. And it looked like it was doing type ahead because the API was responding so quickly. And what I'm using there is what they call JSONP, which is really JavaScript. JSONP drives me insane. It's JavaScript kids. They're just asking for JavaScript. So if you have an API that will, that will return JavaScript back to you wrapped in a callback, you can specify the callback with the same goofy random variable that, that you just created. So it's goofy random variable dot call dot, uh, dot f dot whatever it is. And whatever it is is sitting there waiting for that callback. And that actually works really well. I have a lot of, um, a lot of examples of that. And it was just a little bit too complicated for this talk. I really wanted to do it, but thanks. Um, I understand why iframes are necessary. Uh, currently, the standout thing I don't like about iframes is they, um, they're a little wishy-washy security-wise. 
Um, people have figured out this wonderful hack for using them to, to communicate things that should not be communicated back and forth uh, between frames, and they're using that to track your whereabouts on the internet. And that's, that's just a little icky for me. Um, but what I'm hearing from customers who say, I don't like the iframed pin it button right now, for instance, is they can't instrument that. They can't, um, I have to supply them with a way to get a callback from me eventually if somebody clicks the pin it button. That's the main thing. Can you load an external style sheet with the unique IDs? Uh, not, you know, I bet you could. I bet you could load a style sheet, and then you would have to actually bring it up. You could potentially copy the style sheet into a, a, a line of text and do that same, same search and replace and, and save it back out. I bet you could do that. I haven't tried it. Is it worth it if it's got a lot of thousands? Probably, probably extremely worth it, yeah. I, I would say um, loading a, a large style sheet. But you shouldn't be shipping a giant style sheet for a tiny widget, right? You know, it should be... Pretty small. Um, the toughest thing is the, the CSS reset. I just ran out of time, I think. Uh, yeah, I'm out of time-ish. Um, the toughest thing is the CSS reset. You need to kind of build a wall around everything. And there are, there are great ways of doing that, too. And, and a great start is the unique ID um, that, that you have around the, the widget. I think that's all the time I have. Thank you very much.